Hello, and welcome to the Evidence-Based Exercise Rehabilitation and Sport Performance channel. This channel is for the healthcare movement professional looking to incorporate applied research concepts into their current practice setting. Today's topic, Neurological Cross-Transfer Training. The objectives of this discussion are to Discuss the parameters involved in creating cross-transfer neurological changes during unilateral exercise programming, and provide a means by which you can utilize this strategy into your own programming and or setting. Today we'll be highlighting reported outcomes by Goodwill et al. that relate to the use of cross-transfer training. Please note, there are additional outcomes performed in this study that we'll not be discussing since they are centered around other topics. So diving a little bit deeper into this study, in accordance to the Oxford Center for Evidence-Based Medicine, this study is a randomized controlled trial and falls under the category of level two. To help summarize things, I've taken and extracted the programming components that were used in this study. So you'll see we had 14 healthy subjects between the ages of 18 and 35, seven male participants, and seven female participants. They were randomly assigned to either a strength training or a control group. The body area that was exercised was, were the knee extensors of the dominant limb, and the type of exercise utilized was a single leg squat. The outcome measures included a maximal voluntary isometric contraction and motor evoke potentials. Specific programming parameters included nine sessions over three weeks, which worked out to three days per week. During week one, the individual worked at 80% of a one rep max for four sets of eight reps. During week two, it was, was, this was increased by 2.5%, and they worked four sets of six to eight reps. During week three, this was 85.5% of a one rep max for four sets of six reps. The strategy utilized was to pick an exercise tempo of three second concentric to four second eccentric contractions during the single leg squat with the use of an auditory metronome. Now let's have a look at our statistical results. The cross transfer results reported a 35.4% increase in strength for the untrained knee extensors when compared to controls. Additionally, a 34.9% increase in MEP max following strength training when compared to controls was also observed. If you're not familiar with motor evoke potentials or MEPs, they're commonly used as a measure to understand the execution and performance of movement and or to quantify physiological change in cortical spinal excitability of the motor system. When we compare the trained to the untrained leg in this study, the untrained leg received more than half the MEP gain, around 61%, that was observed in the trained leg. For those of you who typically skip the stats section in an article, I'd like to help you make more sense of this information from a clinical application standpoint. Let's begin with power. Power can be defined as having a sample size that was adequate enough to detect a difference between the things you're studying. In this case, there was an actual difference reported. P was less than 0 0.001. We saw that on the last slide. Remember that your sample is a representative of the greater population. If your sample size is too small, the ability to detect a difference when a true difference exists is diminished. Typically, a power reported at 0.8 or higher is generally accepted. Let's move on to effect size. The effect size of this study was not reported. What is effect size? Effect size would indicate the percentage of participants in the training group that would experience a similar outcome as those in the control group. When we look at the groups as a whole, the statistics provided for the training group displayed a higher mean average than the control participants. What the effect size helps us to understand is the proportion of the training group participants that scored in the same range as the control group. In other words, the effect size tells us how large or small this proportion is. Lastly, let's talk about the 95% confidence intervals. These two were not reported. 
The 95% confidence intervals would provide us with a range of scores that we could estimate the greater population would fall into 95% of the time. This assumes that the same conditions parameters were provided to individuals from the same demographic. A working range provides the clinician with how much variance they could potentially expect when the intervention is applied to the greater population. Now it's time for clinical gyms. All right, all right, all right. So what are we walking away with here today? Our evidence-based truth, increased cortical activation following unilateral resistance training resulted in a cross transfer of strength and motor performance of the contralateral side. Please keep in mind that results will vary and they are individual and setting dependent. What kind of implementation strategies did the authors use to apply this truth to the body? The authors had the participants work at a high percentage of a one rep max, anywhere between 80% and 85. All reps were performed at a slow controlled tempo of a four second eccentric and three second concentric contractions. In the strategy of motor training, through the use of a metronome pace movement at a preferred tempo help to facilitate use dependent neuroplastic changes. Now before you go and simply apply this new evidence-based truth and these strategies to your practice, there's a couple things that we need to sit back and reflect on. First, you need to have an understanding of what these truths and strategies can provide you with you simply just don't randomly throw them into the mix of whatever you're doing. Design with a purpose. How can we use these in the setting that we're currently working in? Has an individual been immobilized? Does a person fatigue out very quickly on one side? Are you trying to work around pain? There needs to be a reason as to why you're trying to use this cross transfer effect. Next, you need to have a measurable outcome to determine the clinical effectiveness of your design. People do not use MEPs clinically. It takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of training, and they are expensive pieces of equipment. What can you use to determine if a change has taken place? What are your measures that you like to use clinically? Are you looking at motion? Are you looking at functionality? Are you looking at reduction of pain? You need to have a before and after test to see if this type of training is having the measurable effect that you want it to. Lastly, all these effects need to be tied back to addressing your patient and client goals. That's the big picture. What are we getting them back to? Here at the channel, we're dedicated to establish and foster a positive interprofessional environment in which learning can occur, regardless of your profession and or previous training. If you're a healthcare movement professional looking to incorporate more evidence-based research application into your own practice, please subscribe and join our community, where the number one goal is improving the lives of those we serve. Stay tuned. In the next video, we'll be looking at some research that is aimed at creating greater levels of descending motor output. Thanks for hanging with us today. See you in the next video.